There are currently eight teams in the Pacific Division of the NHL. I can categorize all eight teams of that division into what's called the universal set, represented by my rectangle on the outside. I'm going to use circles or ovals to represent my subsets, beginning with the team that I love, the Edmonton Oilers. I can also throw the Los Angeles Kings into there because Wayne Gretzky did eventually go onto that team. My medium teams or mediocre teams, we could throw in here, we have the Vancouver Canucks and then these other four. They all have good skilled players, but some of them don't always exercise gentlemanly play. So in this universal set where we know we have eight Eight teams, the number of elements in the universal set is eight. We can see that we currently have two teams in the love category. We currently have five teams in the kind of love mediocre category. We're missing one team. So that one team that we're missing fits outside of those ovals or circles, but still inside the rectangle that represents the universal set. And so that team would be the good old Calgary Flames. I don't love them. They're not even a team that I medium kind of like, but they are part of the universal set representing the Pacific Division. So they go here on the outside in the rectangle outside of the circles or ovals and they are what we call the complement. So it's anything that's part of the universal set but it is outside of the subsets that we have defined. Set theory can be used to classify objects or elements. We've looked at sets of numbers in previous years of mathematics, such as the natural numbers, the whole numbers, the integers, and so on, and even used diagrams to help illustrate the relationships between them. Within our universal set is all of the objects or elements that are being considered. We also have a finite set versus an infinite set. So a finite set, think about the English terminology, is a limited number of objects or elements versus an infinite set, which is gonna go on forever in theory. So a finite set, for example, would be all integers from one to seven. We can actually count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. An infinite set would just be a set such as the integers. It is not possible to count all elements within that set. Then diagrams can be used to visually show how we classify the elements within a set. We can also use it to represent the number of elements we have within a set, and the notation is really key here. When asked to list the elements within a set, we can begin with a brace, so this says a set of, we can separate each element with a comma, and then we can close the brace. When we're asked to give the number of elements within that set, you're going to see a little n in front of that set. So this means the number of elements in set E. We are not multiplying those, this is not algebra. So anytime you see that little n, you have to remember number of elements in set E is, for example, there are currently eight teams in the Pacific Division of the NHL. That's what my universal set happens to represent. There are two teams or two elements within the love category of my subset. There are five teams in the mediocre category of my subset. This is a list of the elements within my love category. This is the number of elements within my love category. We can also say that L is a subset of the universal set. So every element within my love category is also a member of my universal set. And you may recognize that the subset symbol looks very similar to the less than symbol. There are less elements in my love category than there are in the universal set, but every member of this L category is within that universal set. This set is a subset of this set. Every element within this set is also contained within this set, and this is the notation for not a subset, so not a subset. We use the prime notation, that little tick mark, to indicate the complement. So every element that is a part of the universal set but does not belong to that particular subset, we say is the complement. So it is outside of that set. And you have to be careful because it's just this tiny little tick mark. So every time you see that, think of not. So the elements not in subset E or in set E. In this diagram, the Calgary Flames would be my complement. They are part of that universal set, but they are not within one of my defined subsets. An empty set is a set containing no elements. So for example, 
teams within the Pacific Division of the NHL that are currently located in Sweden. There are none. So we can denote that two ways. We can either have a circle with a slash through it or just a set of braces with nothing in the middle. So both of these symbols indicate an empty set. There's no elements. If we want to think of a mathematical example, an empty set would be the set of odd numbers divisible by two. There is no odd number that is divisible by two. So this is another example of something that would be considered an empty set. Disjoint sets have no elements in common. For example, the set of teams in the Pacific Division of the NHL and the set of teams in the Atlantic Division of the NHL. A team cannot be part of the Atlantic Division and the Pacific Division. Those are disjoint sets. A more mathematical example would be the set of even numbers and the set of odd numbers. A number cannot be even and odd. They are in two different sets. Those sets are disjoint. Each set contains no elements of the other set. And we can use disjoint sets to represent mutually exclusive events. So for example, if we roll two dice and then have one subset as all sums that are less than six, we have another subset that represents all sums greater than six. There is no sum that is going to be both less than six and greater than six. They're either going to be in this category or this category. So mutually exclusive events are when it is not possible for two events to occur at the same time. We're not going to have a sum less than six we're not going to have a sum greater than six at the same time. The sun is not going to rise and set at the same time. Those two events are mutually exclusive. We use a Venn diagram to visually represent the relationship between the subsets and the universal set. We use a rectangular box to represent the universal set. We use either circles or ovals to represent the subsets. So in this particular diagram, E is my universal set. So I can have the number of elements in my universal set E is, and we usually write this at the bottom. So we fill in whatever the number is here. This is my subset T, and then T prime is my complement. So every element that is part of that universal set but is not contained in subset T is going to be in T prime. This is my complement down here. We tend to put the complement down here in the bottom right corner, but just be aware, sometimes you'll see it over here. The complement is in theory anything within the universal set outside of T. So all the space in here could be the complement. We can represent a set of elements using either words, a list, or set notation. Each one of these three statements represents the exact same set, and that set happens to be the even numbers from 1 to 20. You'll notice that each one of them has the braces around them. That means a set of. So the list, the even numbers from 1 to 20 are 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. And notice we're separating each element with commas. And the set notation you're somewhat familiar with, if you think back to domain and range. So this says a set of x values such that x is equal to 2n, and then n happens to be an element of the integer. So we know that n is going to be positive or negative whole numbers, and then we are defining n by saying that it's going to be greater than or equal to 1, n is going to be less than or equal to 10. So if I substitute, let's say n is equal to 1. If I put a 1 in here, 2 times 1 is 2, that gives us our first element. My next integer between 1 and 10 is 2. If I substitute a 2 in here, 2 times 2 gives me 4, that's my next element. We would continue on. My next integer between 1 and 10 is 3, 2 times 3, multiply those together, the product is 6, and so on, and that will give us our list of elements. We're going to conclude this lesson with one final example where we're asked to write out the elements of each set and then to display those results in a Venn diagram. We are told that our universal set is set E such that E is equal to 2 times n, n is an element of the natural number system. So remember the natural numbers are the numbers you naturally begin to count with, beginning with 1, 2, 3, etc. So our whole positive numbers and n is going to be greater than or equal to 1 n is going to be less than or equal to 10. So the first thing we're going to do is start with n is equal to 1. Substitute 1 in here. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 is our first element within set E. We can continue on. Our next natural number is 2. We substitute a 2 in here. 2 times 2 is 4. That's the next element in our universal set. 
Our next natural number is 3. 2 times 3 is 6. That is the next element in our universal set. Continuing on until we get to the last number, n is equal to 10. So if I substitute in a 10, 2 times 10 is 20. We're then going to list the elements in each of the three subsets. So remember, our universal set contains these 10 elements. So subset f is going to be equal to 4n. Again, n is going to be a natural number greater than or equal to 1, less than or equal to 5. So I'm going to begin by substituting a 1 in. 4 times 1 is 4. That's the first element in subset f. I'm going to continue on. My next natural number is 2. 4 times 2 is 8, that's my next element, and so on. In subset x, we're told that x is equal to 6n. Again, n is an element of the natural numbers. n is greater than or equal to 1. n is less than or equal to 3. So if I substitute in a 1, 6 times 1 is 6. That's the first element within that set. 2 times 6 is 12. That's my next element. And 3 is my last one. 6 times 3 is 18. And subset s is my even square numbers. Now remember, they have to be within this universal set. So my square numbers, we know 1 squared is 1. That's not part of that universal set. 2 squared is 4. We do have that number. 3 squared is 9. 9 is not part of the universal set. 4 squared is 16. 16 is part of that universal set. And 5 squared is 25. It is number 1, not even. Number 2, it's also not part of the universal set. So we're going to make a list, first of all, of the elements that need to go into our universal set. Now that we have a list of the elements for each set, we're going to display or organize those results into a Venn diagram. So remember, the rectangular box indicates my universal set. In this particular case, my universal set happens to be E, and I can see that there are 10 elements within my universal set. So the first thing I'm going to do is right up in the top corner here, this is going to be my universal set E, and then I'm going to go right down to the bottom, and we're going to indicate that the number of elements in set E my universal set happens to be 10. So when I'm finished, I have to have 10 elements within that rectangle. Each element can only go in there one time. So you have to think about how to organize this so that each element is going in only once. So the first thing we're going to do is go through the list of elements and we're looking for overlap. So I know that each of these 10 numbers has to fit somewhere into that rectangular box, but I'm going to take a look at my three subsets and we're going to say, okay, do we have any elements that appear in more than one set? And then if you have different colors of pens, it helps if you can kind of color coordinate these. So I can see right away. I have a 4 and a 4. I also have a 16 and a 16. So those appear in both F and S, those two subsets. I can also see, so I'm going to choose a different color because I have 12 that appears in subset F as well as in subset X. And then just kind of take a look and say, is there any other number within here that is going to fall in those other subsets? The only ones that are not yet categorized are 8, which doesn't appear anywhere else, nor does 20, 6, or 18. So I think we're good on that front. Because I can see that I have elements appearing in more than one subset, I know that I will not have disjoint sets. So when I draw my circles or ovals in the Venn diagram, I'm going to draw intersecting ovals or intersecting circles. If possible, we're going to begin in the middle. So if we take a look, are there any elements that appear in all three sets? There are not in this case, but if there are, we're going to put those in the middle first, and then we're always going to work out from the middle. So we can see that this section here represents the elements belonging to F and X, but not S. And I actually had to change that. I had the wrong letter written in there. So in this section here, the elements in F and X are 12. So we're going to write 112 in that section. And then continuing on, we can also see that we have elements common to both F and X. 4 and 16. So F and S is this section here because they are not part of the X circle. So we're going to fill in here 4 and 16 are going to go here. So this is my F circle. So we're going to take a look at the F elements and we're going to say, okay, we've got 12 on that diagram. We've also got 4 and 16. So maybe actually let's go up here. We'll check off we've used 4 and we've used 16. We can also see that we have 8 and 20 belong to F only. So that's this section here, F only. So we can fill in 8 and 20 are going to go there. And then again, I'm also going to check off there's 8 and there's 20. I can see that in my subset 
x. We've already got within subset x, we have that 12 in there. x only is going to be 6 and 18. So that's going to go in this section here. So we can fill in the 6, we can fill in the 18, separate them with commas. And again, there's 18 and there's 6, we can check that off. And then in the square numbers, we already have the two elements in the square numbers already in the Venn diagram. So are we finished? No, we're not. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements in our Venn diagram. We have 10 in the universal set, so we're missing three. So again, if you go back up here, this is why I kind of check them off as we go. We can see that we're still missing a two, a 10, and a 14. So those are the complement. They are part of the universal set, but they are not part of any of those three subsets. So we have to put those down in the complement. So do not forget the complement. When you are done, double check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Make sure that each element appears only one time and don't forget the complement. And then just as an aside, in this particular example, we would also say that S is a subset of F because if we take a look at this, every element within S is also contained within F. So S is a subset of F. So this Venn diagram is another way that we could have organized that same information. Because we have nothing in these three sections of S, we could have just written it as S being a subset of F. Every element within S is also contained within F. And the first day is always a little daunting, but as time goes on and we keep practicing, you're going to become familiar with both the terminology as well as the notation and how to draw it. So it's all going to come together and we're going to be able to classify and organize and then analyze and evaluate different pieces of information.